talking after Shan is reading. I'm always the one that comes after Shan now. There's not much to say at this point after uh, the reading. So um, thank you guys. Another round of applause for our reading. start the open mic. I forgot to mention or I just want to remind everyone that um, books are on sale at Pretty Marrow in the Museum of Coming and Going, also Shannon's uh, The Red Riding Hood Papers. Also we have um, people of Helicon West, so a number of people who read here often. Um, this is for sale as well in the back. So, um, I don't know, I guess we need to get the, the list here and just go at it. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right, so I'll just call people up. Please. And so go buy books in the back during the open mic because Shannon and Laura will go back to the table right now and be ready to sign those books. Don't be shy, just go on backwards. Good job. Okay, so first up we've got Alex, Isaac, and Diane. Go at the League of Utah Writers, so I know there are a couple of people here from that, and so they get to enjoy it again. The rest of you get to enjoy it for the first time. It's called uh, Winnie the Pooh and Friends, the sequel. It may come as no surprise to you that Christopher Robin, who spent much of his childhood romping through the Hundred Acre Wood with a motley assortment of animals, became a veterinarian when he grew up. One day, Dr. Robin as he is now known, went for a stroll in an enchanted place where he had said goodbye to his dear friend Winnie the Pooh many years ago. He hadn't been there very long when a plump yellow bear wearing a red shirt that was much too short and a tiny pig wearing a hot pink sweater ran up to him. Oh, Mr. Robin, it is so good to see you, exclaimed Pooh, craning his neck to see Dr. Robin's face, but you're so much taller than I remember. Silly old bear, laughed Dr. Robin as he squatted and looked Pooh in the eye. That's what happens when children grow up. Then he noticed Pooh's pot belly and gasped. It was even bigger than he remembered. Pooh, you're obese, he blurted out, <laughs> placing you on a strict diet. Pooh, being a bear of very little brain, could only think of one thing. Is it a diet of honey? He asked Pooh. <laughs> no, I'm afraid that's the problem, Pooh, Dr. Robin explained. You can't honey anymore, not one drop. Pooh pouted. Oh, bother. And then Piglet squeaked. Am I obese too? <laughs> Dr. Robin laughed and then exclaimed, goodness no, Piglet, you are underweight. Oh, dear, dear, dear stuttered Piglet. <laughs> Don't worry, Piglet, reassured Dr. Robin. You just need to eat more carbs. You'll gain weight in no time. Now about your speech impediment. Oh, oh, what's uh, imped ped pediment. Sounds hopeless. No in the big gray donkey <laughs> with long drooping ears and sad eyes as he plodded up to them. You're that's not true, Dr. Robin admonished. You're just severely depressed. <laughs> <laughs> There's never any good news, said your <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robin stood, opened his medicine bag, and handed him a brown bottle filled with pills. Here's some good news, he said with a smile. It's called Prozac. <laughs> Take one every morning. Suddenly, a bright orange tiger appeared out of nowhere and pounced on Dr. Robin, knocking him to the ground and spilling bottles and medical instruments everywhere. He growled, Hello, I'm Tigger. That's spelled T I double G R. <laughs> yes, I know that, said Dr. Robin feeling a little uneasy underneath the large tiger twitching an oddly shaped tail. Tigger, he remarked hesitantly, you have a very rare skeletal abnormality of the tail. I knew it, Tigger shouted with glee. I'm the only one. <laughs> then he jumped off Dr. Robin and dashed to and fro, belting out his favorite lyrics. The wonderful thing about Tiggers is, Tigger shouted Dr. Robin as he got up and brushed dirt off of his clothes. 
I'm ordering you to see a behavioral therapist who will teach you to sit still. <laughs> Immediately, Tigger sat on his haunches, stuck his nose up into the air, and proclaimed hotly, sitting still is what Tiggers do best. <laughs> Dr. Robin rolled his eyes in disbelief. I'll see if that's still true the next time I visit. Tigger looked at him suspiciously. When will that be? Six months from now. Six months, he cried. Tiggers do not like sitting still for months. By and by, Dr. Robin returned to the 100-acre wood for a follow-up visit, but Ewer was the only one he could find. He looked as forlorn as ever and was missing his tail. Eeyore, Dr. Robin asked, where's your tail? It's gone, said Eeyore with a sad finality. Gone? What happened to it? Pooh took it. <laughs> Pooh? Why would Pooh take your tail? So it could bounce like Tigger. <laughs> Wait, Dr. Robin said, scrunching up his eyebrows in confusion. Why would Pooh want to bounce like Tigger? He was on Prozac. <laughs> <laughs> what? I prescribed that for you, not Pooh. Yeah, well, he got so depressed after he told him he couldn't eat honey anymore. With much effort, Dr. Robin suppressed the scream. This was not how he imagined treating his friends. He took a deep breath and tried to think rationally. Okay. So Pooh Mouse is like Tigger now. Why isn't he here with you? Tigger got upset that he wasn't the only Tigger anymore. He jumped Pooh and broke his back. Pooh can't get out of bed. <laughs> Dr. Robin was shocked. Where's Tigger? He asked. Jail. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robin felt like he was about to faint. He dreaded asking about Piglet, but his curiosity got better of him. So he sighed and asked, what about Piglet? Piglet isn't Piglet anymore, Eeyore lamented. What do you mean? You told him to eat more carbs. So he ate Pooh's honey, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and yes? He gained weight, a lot of weight. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Robin said, why isn't he here? I can help him lose weight. Eeyore looked at him with mournful eyes. Piglet became a pig, a big, fat porker. <laughs> <laughs> As a scream escaped Dr. Robin's lips, Eeyore added, told you there's never any good news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm loud, so I'm just gonna read right here. Um, during the writing of this poem, I realized that liars is one of the hardest words for a dyslexic to write. So that was always a problem when I was a kid, so I remembered my special ed teacher's mnemonic, what do you call that? Mnemonic. Mnemonic, mnemonic device about how the difference between liars and lairs. And, uh, Liars, low-down, snake-bellied falsifiers. Lairs, snake dens, dragon's treasure, where all the secrets are held. <laughs> this is a poem called Letters Are Liars. And there's an epigraph. A letter is a joy of earth. It is denied the gods. Emily Dickinson. Letters are liars, tricksters, like a brother's punching your arm and leaving it dead. J's and I's put on distinguished fronts when capital, but lowercase they are cruel as children's laughter, wicked tails and dotted nails, but B's and D's are the worst. Lowercase Benedict Arnold's always switching sides, making your tongue trip. Then P joins the circus confusing vertical as well as the horizontal. The teacher says, read them slow, sound them out, but I hear them shift the letters, the children in their seats, and every stammer, with each longer and longer pause, I hear them murmur, giggling in twitters, the sound like turning pages. Stop laughing, stop laughing, Bert bursts from my tight throat. I just want to build block towers to marvel 
my classmates, so tall I can barely touch the steeples, stop laughing. But they've stopped, and the teacher's mute. Stop laughing, stop laughing, stop laughing, I scream to a now silent room. I slam down the book and it bounces off the floor, spine broken. I flip over the desk and it makes the sound of a broken guitar string. They are liars, liars. Snot runs from my nose, tears burn my eyes, and I hit the floor with my fist. The teacher tries to hold me as if rage can be held. Calm down, calm down, she pleads, whispers. But I hang in the circle of her arms, screaming until the principal comes, until all the students crowd the door like magpies. I'm ferried away to a storeroom until the bus comes and they pin a note to my shirt and I can't come back to school until they talk to my parents. And as I walk down the hall, head down, the teacher stops me with a hug and the sea of students part. Her on my knees and me trying to escape. You can't hold rage or shame, but she tries anyways. And as I teeter in her arms, she refuses to let me fall. words, we and weighty, an import to might and town, pepper weed in the church lawn, a wild card, rises early, stokes the fire, tends chickens, grandma and me, wears his cards close to his chest, a full house, knows the local pool hall, an angle shop from ball to pocket, chews the fat, risks the short stack, a straight flush. I dance in place, lose my pee. It's hard being left behind. At last I hear his step on the porch, my ace of hearts. Blackjack today, the king of cards. You're ready to play the best. I ante up, get hit, stay. Make a folk poker face, learn to bluff. My grandpa was a gambling man who bet on me when I was four. <clears throat> that I could play a grown-up game and come out unafraid. Yeah. Okay, it looks like uh, Tim Keller, Matt H., and Megan Burton. throwback Thursday thing. I read this for the first time several years ago. It just kind of stared at me from my computer screen today as I was trying to work on something else, so I took it as a sign. Um, this won't make any sense to you now, but the day I read this, a uh, gentleman got up just before it was my turn to read and read a diatribe about how if anything ever offended him from a moral perspective, he would leave the room. <laughs> So, yeah, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Isn't that how it works? Simply spout that, excuse me, I'm having trouble seeing it. Simply spout that infamous mantra of mobsters, cheating spouses, and the I tried it once in college crowd. Since the first neon spires rose from the sands, and everything's forgotten, is it not? Well, no longer, my friends. The internet has seen to that. Ah, but I've gotten ahead of myself. Best to start from the beginning, I suppose, after two years of culinary training. And three years of flying through the darkest recesses of America's finest kitchens, I tired of watching obsequious little incompetence pass me by. This is not what I signed up for. Quite the opposite, in fact, I left New York to see my fortune. 
that's how I wound up on the cooking segment of Channel 2 News, somewhere in a nameless Midwestern hellhole, where I spent my afternoons teaching housewives and grandmothers newer, better ways to make funeral potatoes. It wasn't all bad, not at first anyway. I even tried the entrepreneurial route, placing an offer catering for catering services in the local gazette, which ad I promptly withdrew after my first and only call found me fielding questions from a vocally androgynous, conversationally declined, declined creature who inquired after my ability to make them little weenies in a blanket. <laughs> Determined to make the best of my exile, I purchased a membership at the local health club, Jake's Feet Store and Gym. But upon asking about their Pilates schedule, was met with a stare so blank I found myself unable to lift even a single weight. Finally, my sanity hanging by a thread, I began to work on my book, A Natural Selection, a suspense thriller about a master chef who's surrounded by idiots, poisons an entire town. A real page turner, if the critics are to be believed, which brings me back to Vegas. My agent arranged for me to host a celebrity restaurant review. Great publicity for the book, she said. Unfortunately, the idea, while theoretically sound, was, in its application, an unmitigated disaster. Having spent the first day dining with the great unwashed in Vegas' most wretched of repasts, the buffet, I was looking forward to a glass of fine wine with something delightful for dinner. Alas, at restaurant after celebrity endorsed restaurant, it was more of the same. Bad food, worse service, millionaire chefs, not good enough to cook for my dog, getting rich off it all. The only bright spot, nay, the only way to get through the meal, the day, for that matter, the entire tour was the wine. You see, good listener, what the city of sin lacks in terms of culinary sophistication, it more than makes up for with the booze. As the week went by, my sampling of the entrees got smaller and the glasses of wine more numerous. Hindsight being what it is, that's probably where things went south, as it were. What got you into cooking, my co-host asked. Co-host, indeed. Little more than a walking, talking silicone repository, but I digress. I'd almost forgotten she was there, along with the crew, the camera, the vindictive little peons behind it. Crisco, I heard myself say. The words were only slightly slurred, yet from somewhere deep within, my own personal alarm bells rang, normally deafening and quite urgent. Today they were distant, warm, even melodious. I lifted my glass, swirling the god-sent nectar, and drank. The liquid slid down my throat, and the clock soon fell silent. I felt in rare form and decided to have a little fun with the crew. If you're not going to take this seriously, she began. Oh, I'm quite serious, I corrected. In fact, I would have to say that Crisco was responsible for everything I am today. I waved my hand around the room up to and including all of this. You see, I went on, there comes a time in the life of every young man where the world becomes a bit brighter, a bit more exciting, if you will. In the midst of it all, he will invariably discover a new and wonderful source of entertainment. Questioning glances were shared all around. Like overused toys, abused, if you prefer, I added with a smirk, enjoying the bemused expressions of my compatriots. Things can grow worn and uncomfortable. While the obvious solution to this problem equates to less wear and tear on the apparatus, if you will, the next most obvious and only plausible solution is to find an acceptable emollient. And so began my quest. I laughed alone. Being a reasonable intellect and not entirely unschooled, I used the time offered honored scientific method of experimentation to ascertain that shampoos are wonderfully slippery. <laughs> Not to mention convenient in terms of my morning, evening, and occasional midday shower. Sadly, shampoo also burns. <laughs> Mother's hand lotion worked delightfully well. However, the fragrance of lilac emanating from one's nether region seemed difficult to explain in a locker room setting, <laughs> as was the need for copious amounts of lotion to mother. <laughs> Is this your idea of a joke? The co-host asked. Vaseline, I continued, <laughs> looking her right in the eye, <clears throat> was likewise eliminated owing to its consistency, which is so thick as to leave one feel like a recently bleached axle. The cameraman and grip doubled over laughing. Suffice to say, my search did not go well, but with moderation being my only alternative, I redoubled my efforts. 
If a suitable compound existed, I would find it. Through thick and thin I searched. Then the day came. Mother was baking cookies and asked me to grease the sheet. I rubbed the shortening on the cookie sheet and Eureka, light, easy, clean, I've been quite pliant. Search was over. What does any of this have to do with your being a chef? My co-host interrupted her grassy voice, thick with undisguised loathing. I swirled the contents of my glass, relished its bouquet, as I recalled that fateful day. What on earth happened to all my Crisco? Mother asked. Crap. The one factor I'd left out of my experiments, the law of supply versus demand, I had to think fast. I used it, Mom. Uh, sorry. You used it? Um, yeah, I told her, thinking only a word or two ahead. I've been trying to learn how to cook, you know, and a surprise for you, and, well, I'm not very good yet. <laughs> well, that was that, I suppose. <laughs> I hadn't been caught, but the thought of Mother walking into the kitchen to find me in the most awkward of positions amongst her favorite pans was more than enough to encourage moderation. <laughs> The following day, however, I walked into my room after school for some well-deserved moping, and my bed I saw two things. The Way to Cook by Julia Child, and a new drum of Crisco. <laughs> <laughs> it was all very touching, I must say, and after such a heartwarming display of support, well, what choice did I have? <laughs> I practiced, 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 and got some baking done as well. <laughs> After graduation came culinary school, and voila, thanks to Crisco, <laughs> we are today. <laughs> well, I thought the story entertaining. <laughs> and the telling of it flawless, as did, judging from the comment section of YouTube, uh, the, very, the many viewers. Unfortunately, the TV station did not. I found myself collecting unemployment before my flight hit the ground. The hardest part was telling mother, of course, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> then the funny thing happened. The sales of my book went through the ceiling. Talk shows began to call, and here I am, my debut on my very first reality TV series, Master Bake. <laughs> I know, it's not exactly the high road, but as Mother always said, when life hands you lemons. <laughs> footsteps of spring river waters trample over each other, trample the margins of a stone bed, the margins of his restless mind, bled of the boy he once was. He sleeps pressed in against the old lace bedroom wall and wrapped in laurel jersey cotton sheets and calls of the younger brother he once knew, whose embrace, now mined, recollects a Chaplin film gone by. He hears the shallow breathing of cracked willow trees, the whisperings of leaves that serve as a backdrop to those dreams bleak and rank with the stench of Morpheus wearing his brother's face, a face long since swallowed by the tramplings of an arbitrary grace. <clears throat> October 17th, 2014. I trek barefoot over spruce root, over limestone and thyme, over the sagebrush covered back of Naomi Peak's calloused lines. I wade through the absized scraps of silver blue thorns, through the aspen gold leavings unfastened from their finger trap bones. I attend to the groves of cantankerous husks of quaking aspen recoiled as it curtsies, then thrusts its cream-colored torso with all its black spots toward the ghost-covered space of a sky on the cusp of another winter. I watch white pine water reflect the orange-red rock of a gray calcite cliff of the mountain Magog as it ingests the sun's light. I count years two last night, until I, perhaps, take my place by my dead brother's side. Mommy is not very tall. Okay. 
I believe one of you has heard these before. Regrettably, you're going to hear them again. There's a set of three poems, and they all are about the same person. So I hope I have enough time to read them all. Okay. There's a girl. She's beautiful, passionate, and one of the most loving people I've ever met. She laughs easily, doesn't take any shit, and stands up for her beliefs. This girl is funny, intelligent, kind, and has the kind of beauty inside that shines through. I can talk to her about anything, and she'll listen, and give help when she can. When I'm with her, I am home. No matter where we are, as long as I'm with her, it doesn't matter what other people think or say, because for the first time in my life, I'm in love. And this love is crazy, beautiful, deep, and raw. I know it will be hard, and I know there will be disapproval, but I don't give a damn. Because I am in love with a gorgeous, blonde, green-eyed girl that burns with a fiery passion the world could never hope to match. No matter what kind of shit I'm going through, you are always there. No matter what I say, no matter whether or not you understand, you are always there. Today was the first time I had ever seen you cry, and it killed me to know that it was because of me. But because I knew you didn't want my apologies, my sorries, it would spill out of my mouth like a waterfall that would go on and on and on until the world ended, I mouthed, sorry, 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 I wish I was different, I wish I was different for you. You wonderful being, you who helps me no matter what, you who doesn't believe me when I tell you that you are beautiful. You always bring it back to your looks, and you are gorgeous. Your eyes are the most beautiful color I've ever seen. Your soul burns so bright that I sometimes become blinded, that sometimes my mind goes blank, and all I know is that I want to hold you to make sure you know it's all going to be okay, to make sure that you know you are loved, that no matter what happens, I will always be there for you. You have always been there for me. You try to tell me the same things I tell you about yourself, and just like you, I don't believe. But one day, we will make each other believe, because you are a galaxy, and you never fail to amaze me. Why? Why does it hurt so much to lose someone you never have even had? Is it because she's the first person I ever loved? The first person I am still in love with. The first person that no matter where we are, as long as I'm with her or talking with her, I'm home. I still love her. I love the way she moves. I love how she gets so passionate about things, the way her eyes light up. I love her laugh, her sarcastic humor. I love her voice, her smile, her way of teasing everyone, and then looking at you all wide-eyed like a puppy when you call her out on it. I love the way she, she can always make me laugh, the way she encourages me, the way she loves. We told each other we liked each other, but had decided to wait on the relationship. That was a fucking stupid idea. I was afraid our friendship would be ruined, and because I hesitated so much, I lost her. She is the light of my life. I feel, be feel better, happier around her. I feel loved, but I lost her. And the only, my only chance to be with her may be lost, because while I'm happy for her, because she's happy, I can't help but feel hurt, and I'm jealous of this girl I never even met for being with someone I never even had. So, like, uh, Jeremy, uh, I can't pronounce it. It starts with a G. Let's go, yeah, it's fine. Oh, okay, sorry. And I think that's it. The keys jangle loudly against the cement porch. Shonda looks over her shoulder before stooping to pick them up. After unlocking the deadbolt, she quickly slips inside and closes the door behind her. Renee glances up from the sofa. About time, she says. I swear you get back later and later every day. It's just getting dark earlier, Shonda replies, hanging up her jacket and shaking off the autumn chill. Little Bobby made some hot cocoa for you. At least it was hot when he went to bed. The mug on the counter is cold to her touch. He only used water so it wouldn't spoil, Renee continues, following Shonda into the kitchenette. Was he all right? Shonda asked before taking a sip of the cold chocolate. A little gentleman, as always. I promised him you'd come up and say goodnight when you got in. Setting the still full mug of cocoa aside, Shonda moves to the narrow stairs. 
The third step creaks loudly under her foot, and she freezes momentarily, looking up toward the bedroom doors. It's okay, Bobby's voice drifts down. I'm awake. Shonda shakes her head as she continues to the upper landing and opens Bobby's door. Bobby lays with his arms folded, his, his Digimon bedspread tucked up under his arms, armpits. The lamp on the bedside table paints a pale circle around him. I thought I told you to stop waiting up for me, Shonda says, sitting down on the edge of the bed. I didn't wait, he replies. I just didn't fall asleep yet. Well, maybe you need to try a little harder. All right, he says, reaching his arms up toward her. Shonda leans into his embrace and leaves a kiss on his forehead as he releases her. She reaches for the lamp chain, but Bobby stops her. I'll turn it off after you leave. It keeps the monster to sleep. Oh, right, Shonda says. Do you want me to check under the bed? Bobby shakes his head. You won't be able to see them while they're sleeping. Besides, I'm safe on the bed. Okay then, be safe. Shonda smooths down his pillow matted hair before leaving. She watches for the crack of light into the door to disappear, and is careful to skip the third step she descends to the front door, where Renee is waiting. I wish he wouldn't stay up so late, Shonda comments. You can't blame him for worrying, Renee says. How many times have I told you? You live in the wrong neighborhood to be working so late. Bobby and I are just getting, are getting out just as soon as I can get some money together. Well, until then, he's going to worry. Where do you think he gets all his ideas about monsters? Why do you encourage him anyway? Shonda shrugs. I guess it's easier than telling him about the real monsters, the people who don't care who they hurt, and the people who like to hurt. People like Rob, Renee asks. Shonda turns away, but Renee continues. He's going to come back. As long as you're here, sooner or later, he's always going to come back. I know, Shonda says, wiping an eye as she turns back. But we don't need to get into all that right now. It's late, and you should get home. What do I owe you? Just put it on my tab, Renee says, as she swings open the door and walks out into the dark. Shonda fastens the deadbolt and chain behind her. Shonda bolts upright in her bed. She's already forgotten the sound that aroused her, but she can feel the adrenaline-laced blood charging her limbs. She reaches out her feet for the slippers she kicked off, but gives up and pussyfoots across the cheap carpet, muttering to herself, Renee, if you forgot your phone again, so help me. She pauses at the top of the stairs and stares down into the black. As her eyes acclimate to the darkness, the front door takes shape, ajar. Shonda stares at the chain swinging limply, at the shadowed wood littered on the floor, at the shadows stretched across, across the living room. The shadows move. Shonda backs towards the wall, the breath retreating with her. She reaches her hands out, her fingers crawling until they reach a doorknob. She slips through the door. The latch clacks loudly against the darkness as it closes. She glances around the room, Bobby's room. She creeps to the bed and clicks on the lamp. Hey, baby, she whispers, pulling back the covers. Come with Mommy. We're going to get to Mommy's room. We're going to get Mommy's phone. The third step creaks. Shit. She leaves over Bobby onto the bed. Language, Bobby murmurs, rubbing his eyes. She pulls him close. We're going to be very quiet now. Very, very quiet. Bobby stretches against her, holding back a yawn with his little fist. The doorknob clicks as it turns. Bobby's hand snaps the lampshade, drenching them in the darkness. It's okay, he whispers. We're safe on the bed. Officer Mullaney runs a hand through his hair as he walks out of the apartment into the light of the flashing red and blues. He speed dials the precinct while his partner keeps the neighbors back. We're going to need a forensics team down here, and someone from Homicide. Yeah, the neighbors called in when they heard the screaming. I've seen some messed up stuff on this beat, but this one, I don't know. If it hadn't happened in the kid's bedroom, I'd say it was an animal attack. But both the lady and the kids swear they don't have any pets. Okay, thanks for coming, and uh, we still have books for sale. The and put your chairs down. Oh yeah, pull your chairs down. Thank you, Ben. Yeah.